Okay, so just FYI, I, I do, uh, I have not played around a whole lot with DBV, but it turns out it has this really neat polling feature. So I'm gonna do some polls, or I'm gonna attempt to do some polls. Uh, if you want to participate on the online poll, you can get into the session if, uh, on your laptop. Although I'll also scan the room, but it'll be kind of neater if I can like show your results on, on screen. So if you if you want to, you're welcome to get into the BBB session. But please, just to curb traffic, since you're here in person, uh, join with no what is it the listen only mode or whatever. Apparently, the audio connections take up a fair amount of bandwidth. But you don't have to. Uh, I'm just going to ask people questions and see what they say. You're going to try like the uh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> what is this? Oh, Fuel size. <laughs> wait, wait, no. The Osco Project stickers. <laughs> we have. <laughs> 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 level Gotta be careful what you leave lying around. <laughs> Now I got me thinking of some games. Classic. Okay, let's see here. You didn't, you didn't bring your costume. I don't have a costume. So already the best one. I've already. Had, <laughs> yeah, you would not believe how much work goes into that costume. <laughs> much more than in my my like regular presentation. So I've already I already have some ideas for next for next April. Uh, okay, so oh, it's still it's still not time yet according to this. Actually, I'll give it another. This sounds like a monthly crew opening. <laughs> okay, I'll decide. Okay, um, I'm not seeing the. Uh, oh, those are those are showing up. Okay. Um, Welcome everybody to the Embedded Linux Birds of a Feather session. Uh, I, I noticed this morning that other people like run these boxes without any slides at all. And of course, uh, in true spirit, uh, I've got like 45 slides. <laughs> but but it's we're not gonna go through all of them. Uh, some of them are there for just reference. Some of them I just borrowed out of my status talk. Um, and But the main thing is that most of them, I just have several different areas in case those discussion topics come up, we can go to a slide and, and have something. Um, so this is kind of the high level uh, outline. Uh, there are different technology areas that you might be interested in for embedded. Uh, there's obviously we're here talking about the Linux kernel. Uh, there's some high, high level issues. And uh, I think it's worth talking about the embedded Linux community and then just open discussions on whatever topics uh, we think are the most important. So this is the historical uh, embedded Linux focus areas, uh, you know, system size, boot time, power management, real time security. Uh, so we actually, uh, an audio video drivers, flash file systems, and then support for SOCs and boards, which, you know, is essentially infinite, right? You, you will have that arch support and drivers, you'll have that with you always. Um, so this was a list that we put together in 2003, and uh, luckily, wow. luckily we finished this and moved on to these um, <laughs> architectures, bootloaders, boot time. And this is not comprehensive. File systems, networking, security, um, testing tools, tool chains, tracing, system size, build tools and distros. So this is just kind of off the top of my head because there's much more you can have in here. I, I re realized I didn't have over there updates um, or anything like that. So, but I do, here's my first poll. Okay, so, and I'm gonna poll online and in the room. And uh, please tell me what embedded Linux technology area are you most interested in? 
I'm, I'm sorry if that's hard to read. Is that uh, architectures, bootloaders? Boot Oh, is Jay not on the list? Oh, does it? I can't vote. The old tools. Of... Oh, okay. H is on the list. H H is there. Yeah. We've got we've got one remote vote for system size. Oh, it's coming in. Oh, what? Yeah, no. I'm sorry, video yeah. brothers need to be added back. There are many challenges left there too. Oh, yeah, that's well, but it's going wrong. Okay, you're <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, let me let me jot notes. Oh, by the way. <laughs> oh, hey, look at that. We could, um, if if someone if someone would be willing to, uh, if if there's a good point made, please just put a comment into the chat matrix chat. I don't know who has it open or if anyone has it open. I don't want to, as the speaker, be adding stuff to Matrix chat. But uh, otherwise, I'll have to write stuff down, which is kind of awkward. OK, so let's show you what the slide. I'm going to close the slide. And oh, I didn't I didn't pull the room. Um, OK, really quick, show of hands. Uh, oh, that'll allow you to vote twice. OK, yeah. architectures. OK, oh, well, orange, yeah. <laughs> OK, that's your slide. Six. Uh, bootloaders. Okay, four. Uh, boot time. Okay, oh. oh uh, file systems. Yeah, nobody cares anymore. <laughs> uh, networking. Networking. Oh, yeah, nobody cares about networking. That's good. Okay, security. Can we have safety to that? Uh, okay, we have four. Four in the room. Testing. Okay, my hand goes up for testing. Uh, tracing. Oh, not that much. System size. Oh, a couple of people. Okay, I thought I thought system size was dead. Is it? No, most interesting. It's most interesting. Yeah, most interesting. Uh, uh, and then build build tools and distros. Oh, okay. That's actually that's actually pretty high. Okay, so here's here's the poll results. Our management is done already, too. <laughs> oh, power management. Oh, I got. Uh, uh, here's the thing, though. Power management seems to be doing okay by itself, right? So there's. I, that, uh, that, uh, I mean, I don't know. There's a ton of people working on power management. Aren't there? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, a lot of people, well, a lot of people, too, were interested in testing. Okay, so I think based on that, I think we want to talk about, I think we'll talk a little bit about boot time and system size and testing and build systems. <laughs> size, testing, and then build. Uh, and then one of the things I want to, uh, I'll get, I want to make sure I leave room at the end for for to talk about just kind of the ecosystem and the community. Okay, so uh, let's move on from that. Okay, uh, so I'm going to skip over some stuff. So bootloaders, U-boot. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened with U-boot is you can now support loading images over HTTP. Uh, um, Bootlin did this kind of neat thing called snag boot, uh, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, the latest thing I've seen in terms of kind of upstream work is uh, two things. So, and one of them I didn't put in the slides because I did these before that happened. But so you got the resurrection of You Read Ahead by Steve Rostet, and he's now at Google working on, I think, Chromebooks. And uh, so that's pretty interesting. Um, but my, I guess my question for the audience and for everyone is, okay, so what else is going on in, in boot time reduction in the kernel? Anybody know anything? Oh, the oh, other thing, the, before, we, before I open it up, the other thing is uh, Kasim from TI had a presentation here at Plumbers talking about automotive, uh, about early access to, to hardware. Right, and everybody knows the, the classic example you give a, for a boot time, like kind of a hard requirement, is you got to get the backup camera on as soon as you turn the key. Right, you can't wait ten seconds or something. Uh, but he had a really good example of all the other stuff you got to get 
on like the CAN bus has to come on within 100 mills, milliseconds, I think yep. it was, yep. stuff like that. So, so, and his proposal, I'm going to summarize it poorly, was uh, basically the way that this gets solved is because we can't do it in Linux, we have MCUs that are... <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, see, I can't see the. Oh, see, can't. Okay, I gotta get my matrix chat up. Okay, so I can see. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, I think the proposal was to have Linux communicate in a more uh, standardized fashion with the MCUs that are really bringing the hardware up, which seems like. That's not really making Linux fast enough to do the chore, right? But it, I think it's about as well as we can do right now, unless we do some hardcore stuff. So here's my philosophy. Um, okay, so first, anybody else have ideas about how to improve boot time for Linux, right? So the other thing that was in Kasim's presentation was he talked about you got to get rid of the bootloader. Um, you got to get a you got to get a custom bootloader so you're not initializing every device twice. You're initializing it for the for U-boot, and then you come into the kernel and you initialize it again for the kernel. Um, and so there's a lot of overhead there. It seemed like back when I was like really, really focused on, on uh, um, boot time at Sony, <clears throat> we were doing pretty extreme things like XIP on the kernel images. So we could cut out that I think it was 200 milliseconds to copy the image into RAM. Um, and so, but my understanding is, I haven't done that for years. My understanding is the XIP is dead in, in the upstream kernel. Does anybody know if that's true? Anybody, anybody used XIP lately? Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I thought. We made it easier to use on ARM recently. What, sorry? We made it easier to use on ARM. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. So what? We some work to make it possible on ARM to have it in multi-platform kernels again, which used to not be possible. So now you can actually do it on ARM v7 kernel on any on any target. Uh, I don't think anybody's doing it. Right. The Renaissance folks have one chip with very limited memory, like 10 megabytes, that needs it. I don't know anybody else. Okay. Another interesting thing that. Oh, go ahead. Oh. It's more a question than a suggestion. Did the people here in the room think that asynchronous probing is exploited as much as it could be? No, I don't. I, so so I, I think there's still potential, but it needs a lot of careful well, research or checking for regressions and all that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I see patches around where people try to do that. Yeah, and, and kind of related, the asynchronous probe is actually making more and more stuff actually modular, so it doesn't actually have to load right away. The important stuff can load right away. Uh, right. So one of the <clears> tricks <throat> we did on Sony cameras uh, was we uh, did U we we built USB the USB uh, code as a module, and then we would come up so we could get the the camera screen on, and we could actually start. Uh, messing with the camera hardware because we wanted to autofocus as fast as possible. And then we actually loaded USB as a module like later on in the boot cycle. So it didn't actually come up. It wasn't statically linked in the kernel and it came up later. So I think there is a lot of that kind of tweaking of your boot steps and the modularity like you're talking about. And then one other comment uh, slightly related is is more like not doing cold boot, essentially coming out of a more yeah, of a low, yeah. low power state instead of actually a cold boot. Yeah. That's, a, that's an approach that many have taken too. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, like this never turns off, right? Never really. <laughs> and even when I, even when, well, when I power it down, but like in its state right now, it looks like it's off to end users. Well, except that it comes off with a splash screen. Yeah, so actually, uh, I'm interested in that, but from the user space angle, so like, yeah, Android, um, oh, yeah. it takes forever to boot, right? Oh, so yeah. one of the things that was being asked at the suspend and resume thing is whether hibernate is, is still of interest. And I was like, uh, that'd be interesting for Android, because if you can dehibernate something that's in flash, so to speak, um, that would be much faster than trying to boot, cold boot Android from, from scratch, like, for example, yeah. especially in cars, as you were just saying. Oh, yeah. Um, so an idea, another idea that we played with a long, long time ago, I don't know, and I, async probe, yeah, why isn't async probe used more often uh, is one of the questions I have because it's it didn't exist when I was doing some of the stuff 
at Sony, uh, but it does now. My my impression uh, when it was first added to the kernel is that people were really worried that uh, the dependencies wouldn't come out right. Uh, on you know you have a certain uh, init call sequence that happens, and if you change that sequence up, you're you may end up with problems. You know hardware doesn't come up the way you expect it or something. Well, aren't you uh, weren't you artificially doing that with the USB thing that you were doing later on? Well, but that, I mean, but that was a big chunk that we knew. And USB is not like at the bottom of the dependency tree, yeah, sure. right? These days you have, you know, a device tree has a fairly complex dependency tree for what things have to come up first, right? You got to get your PMIC up, you got to, you know, your power domains start sure. coming up and your clocks. And, and so there's a, there's a whole series of events that you really can't reorder or you got to be careful if you reorder it um, um laurent also says uh, device links are also help reducing boot time by lowering the number of deferred probes yeah 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 no that's really good um uh i don't see saravana in the room so i guess i'll say it for him but that yeah i was going to say the same thing all the dev link stuff that's been happening because of the android gki work for the fully modular kernels that includes modular clocks pin controls regulators all that kind of stuff okay. that's helping in this direction as well okay so another another thing that uh kasim had in his talk was actually i don't i can't remember exactly how he I, I'll mess up the wording of it. He's here. Oh, he's here. <laughs> no. So what was the what was what was the thing? Uh, yeah, give him. I'm going to ask him a direct question. Um, there was something about you split the probe. What's it? What was the device? You split in the, the probe and had a portion that ran early and and something ran later. What device was that? On AM six two like T. TICM62 device. Okay. So that is mainly on the networking side of thing. Like if you want to get your network. Oh yeah, it was the Mac. Up. It was the Phi on the Mac. Yeah, Phi on the Mac. Or, so you yeah. move uh, the filing portion into probe, and then instead of system D. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, you can if you really really know what you're doing, right? You can get more aggressive. I think the problem was that like there was some Mac setup time that was taking 1300 yeah. or yeah. 1.3. Milliseconds yeah, or we got like milliseconds. A, around two millise two point five millisecond, two point okay. five seconds. Two point five seconds. Yeah. So so yeah so sometimes yeah but like deferred probing is really important. One of the other th tricks that we used to do uh, at Sony was uh, we really tried to thread some of the stuff because uh, there are just hard coded delays in the specs for things like. Uh, um, one of them, this is old, but like the uh, the hard drive controller, right? You had to you had to kick it, and then you if you sat there and pulled on it, you would you wouldn't get you had to wait for it like at least a second or something. But if you could kick it and then go through some other stuff and come back to it, and that's kind of more async probing type stuff. Okay, um, okay. Here's another poll. Uh, let's see here. Are there? Oh, another comment. Yeah, Tim. I think there's still a lot of room for improvement because there's so many devices, power-off devices that won't You need a microphone. Yeah. So, Tim, I just want to correct a oh. misconception. It's not resurrection. Chrome OS has been using U-Read Ahead ever since they started in 2009. Oh, really? In fact, my starter project on the Chrome OS team was to improve the boot time for certain for networking. Oh, okay. And it included U-Read Ahead. We also preload drivers to help faster so we don't load them from storage when they're demanded. Oh, okay. Oh, that's great. So, um, okay. Can you, can you read that since you got the mic? Um, Samuel said, yes, moving more device power up code into runtime PM. And then Laurent added, there are also devices that take a huge amount of time due to firmware loading. I recently came across uh, a camera that takes yeah. eight seconds to power up. And you wow. don't want to do that in RPM every time the camera is used. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's true. Actually, didn't you talk about this also, that firmware, if you can offload the firmware loading to something else besides the main CPU or something? So, okay, so there's a ton of techniques. Um, and I just wanna comment on why embedded Linux is so hard. <laughs> so, because this seems like a good, a good place to interject it. Um, 
it's uh, a lot of the, there's a lot of techniques that you can use, uh, but boot time and system size and to some degree power management are all these areas where uh, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? If you go in and you try to fix something, you can't just you can't just find one area where you're gonna shave, you know, like three seconds off. Well, I don't know, maybe. Oh, sorry. Can you repeat that with the, with no, the sir. mic? <laughs> so you said power management and other things, right? Along with this, you should also add security to this. Like when you are booting oh, yeah. the device, you have to authenticate every firmware that is coming up. And right. that that authentication takes a lot of time. Right. So that, that's another problem in which affects boot time. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Laurent says, oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Laurent. Uh, no, I think it has been read already in the, in the chat. I just thought I would join by webcam and microphone because I'm typing too Okay. Much. <laughs> that works for me. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, so embedded Linux is hard because there's a paradox when doing embedded work in open source. Right, is open source is about finding commonalities and generalizing the software to cover as many use cases as you can. And a lot of embedded work is customizing the software, right? Especially in the areas where you're trying to reduce boot up time, you're trying to reduce the system size, you're trying to cut the power management, you're trying to address security concerns. You have very, you, you actually do what I call subtractive engineering. Right, where you go through and you, you know, you're ripping stuff out, or you're shortening code paths, or you're customizing it for your exact platform, and that's the opposite of open source, right? And so it makes it really hard to share. And there's an ecosystem problem. It's really hard to share a lot of our solutions. Come up with a, like you, you, you know, like how do you, you there is like a tiny configuration for the kernel, but like I don't think anybody uses it in products because it's you know, because your product has to have the features you need, right? And they're all different. So anyway, that's just a, a problem statement in general. So I've got my next slide here is a poll. Okay. And this is uh, what, what um, tool do you use to measure boot time? If you're doing boot time work, are you using a stopwatch, a logic probe, uh, print K times, <laughs> boot chart? Kernel function tracing or something else? Okay. <laughs> okay, is it all of the above? Okay, it's all of the above. Okay, I'm not even gonna run the poll then. Uh, so, because we're running out of time anyway. So, um, okay, so the other area we wanna talk about, oh, let's talk, I have file system poll. I think we don't need this file system. Oh, okay, <laughs> Joseph Holzmeyer says, G customer complaints fast enough. <laughs> if if the customer complains, it's not fast enough. Okay, I assume that a lot of people are not using MTD devices anymore. Yeah. yeah. Who's using MTD? Anybody using MTD? My customers. Really? Uh, so what file systems are you running? UBFS. Okay, the answer is UB UBFS. Okay. So none of the other ones are hanging around like LogFS or, or uh, you know, some of these other ones. <clears throat> um, I'm surprised F2FS is not used more, but maybe that's the... Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip real time because, uh, because. <laughs> okay, so system size, oh, okay. Okay, this just kind of chaps my hides. Uh, <laughs> Uh, did you see that slab is going to get removed? There are patches on the mailing list right now to remove the slab memory allocator. Okay, so it was it was sad enough when they removed slob with only like a two uh, version uh, window between deprecation and it's gone. And it's like, how are embedded people supposed to notice this? We're like three years behind on our kernel. <laughs> uh, and already, you know, but so it, did anybody, is it, oh, Oops. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so I, my, my feeling is that we are in a big trend where even 32-bit is getting less and less used. So the system size, uh, like 
who uses who has used 32 bit embedded systems in the last year that's <laughs> <laughs> thank you that, 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 that was almost everybody Read, read the room. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now i'm i'm a big yep who of the people is not even gone to 64 bits yet Okay, so no Respi users in the room because I mean, seriously, uh, Respians just sorted out their 64 bit support a couple of months ago. The, the thing that I found is that uh, out of the few platforms that do not have a 64 bit SOC, most of them just converted to Cortex A35 just in the last year. So it's, we are getting there. Like, obviously, you all have old products that you're still supporting. So those are still 32-bit, and that will continue for another 10 years or so, at least, or 15 or 20. Yeah. Uh, but for for new stuff, there's a huge trend to move away from 32-bit and a huge trend to move away from DDR2 and DDR3 towards LPDDR4, which means system size is much less of a concern. And those people that do care about system size are moving away from Linux. Well, they are. I mean, so there's a whole IoT track going on parallel yeah. to this. That's uh, all Zephyr, right? So it's it's, it's just <laughs> yeah. So you can yeah yeah uh, yeah. Okay. yeah uh, I I just finished the uh, work. Uh, I tried to work on running the 32 bit IOP 32 data type on the Rix 64 bit ISA because uh, our customers they are all traditionally. Uh, 32 bit ISA users and they constantly use the IOP32. And uh, when we introduce our, our processor, is based on the uh, 64 bit ISA, but they still ask me, please let me use the IOP32. So I yeah. I do the job to, to let a Linux kernel built in the IOP32. That, that means maybe the first time Linux kernel built in 64 IOP32 ABI. Yeah. So, what, what's so, the smallest memory, memory configuration that you supported? That how much? What's the smallest memory? Six, 64 megabytes. Six, yeah, sixty-four. 64? Yeah, sixty-four megabytes. That okay. that that's yeah. me. That depends on the uh uh uh, uh, uh manufacturer because uh, currently when you see a uh, chip with, with the right uh, DDR2 is the sixty-four megabytes and the DDR3 maybe is the one hundred twenty-eight megabytes. That's yeah. very popular. The offer. Right. That's it, that's. It, a, a lot of chips, uh, uh, this kind of yeah that, yeah, that is actually a dynamic in the industry that drives uh, the system size requirements, right? Is because um, as the cheapest memory you can get gets bigger, right? Then you're not even gonna you're not even gonna put smaller parts on your on your device, right? No one's gonna put a 16 meg chip on their device when the you know 128 meg chip is the cheaper one. Um, for consumer devices. Now there are other things, but you, you the stuff that like is SRAM based, and it, you have to go all the way down to like two meg before. It... And and I think we pretty much lost that part. Yeah, so... I think we've lost it. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's some good comments here. Yeah. Um, so uh, Philip <laughs> says we use System Tap in the past to improve boot time. Okay. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, uh, another tool there. And then uh, Ira asks, how many 32-bit users are using more than four gig of memory? Okay, so I, I, I know some that are doing it uh, and we want to eventually re remove support for that from ARM32. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. For, re yes, we want to remove high memory, but we don't want to remove support. Like we want to keep support for four gigabyte, not just limited to two, which is the low limit, low memory yeah. limit. Right? Yeah, and, and and that was the reason I want to yeah. running the IOP32 on the 64-bit ISA because if if the user start with the 64-bit ISA, he didn't worry about the uh, uh, memory uh, problem because he could easily change their kernel to the 64-bit uh, kernel, and oh, keep okay. their user space still stay in the 32-bit, and 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 maybe in the future he he can easily. To change it to the 32 bit to the 64 bit, they can mix them together in in our job. So, yeah. uh, so, uh, so that's give them a chance smoothly upgrade their products from the 32 bit to the 64 bit. So, yeah. uh, I think 
IOP32 still is necessary, but for the 60, but for the 62 bit ISA, maybe it's what go away because we found the 64 bit hardware uh, uh, is uh, is equal to the 62 bit ISA in the in the cost in the PPA. Yeah, yeah. so we, we we didn't find any PPA advance if we reduce the general purpose register ways into the 32 bit. So so that's what we we focus on the 64 bit ISA, but we still want to provide a 32 bit solution to to us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're running low on time, so I'm going to have to move on from system size. Um, I had a poll here, but anyway. Oh, one thing I thought I'm going to just throw a little plug in here. So there's been a whole bunch of work on NoLibC recently. I don't know if you know what NoLibC is, but it was made for, uh, I think it was originally developed for testing stuff. It's, uh, you basically replace LibC with a bunch of kernel headers that map stuff directly in into syscalls um, instead of going through a C library. Uh, so it's, and uh, you can actually get very, very small apps. It was written for writing uh, low footprint testing applications. But I'm really curious if anyone has actually like port used this to generate a system. I think it's pretty new. Um, but anyway, anyone anyone used NoLibC? You used it? My friend, I'm a friend working on the NoLibC. It's called it Wu He set a lot of patches to optimize the NoLibC. Okay. And uh, he want to create it. and I and I have a uh, we have the same concept. In the this, uh, uh, that means we we have the same concept that Linux could work for the tiny, tiny memory yeah. devices. We 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 don't we don't want to move to the Zephyr. We don't move, want to move to other atoms. We just stay in the Linux because the Linux provide very sufficient drivers and I, and I, and and drivers is there. So why you need to? Uh, to port into other autos. So that's that's well, a waste of time. As long as you got 32 mega RAM, then you're okay. <laughs> but I don't think I don't think we go below that. Much yeah. These days. So uh, so he uh, his work on NoLibC is to to make the Linux could run very tiny. Yeah. This is memory. Th and yeah. this is user space stuff. So um, okay. So let's see. I had a NoLibC poll. Uh, builds and distros. Okay. Uh, Yocto project. Um, what? Release already came out. Oh, there's a new release. Oh, yeah. see, this is what I get for stealing slides from my <laughs> instead of researching. Um, so I don't know. What is there to say about Yocto Project? Um, world domination. Anyone get world domination? World domination. <laughs> okay, there's a comment back there. <laughs> so we had a lengthy discussion with Denise yesterday. Like, why doesn't Yocto project have LTS Yocto with LTS kernel every year? Resources. Yeah. Resource. The answer was resources. resources yeah. yeah, actually, that is something that I think came up at ELC. We talked about that. Uh, that, and in fact, it's on one of my later slides here. I, we may not get to it, but uh, there's. Uh, <clears throat> there is sometimes inadequate investment in infrastructure for for the in the embedded Linux ecosystem. Um, so it, it hurts a many, right? Like we have to give LTS migration every year. We move kernel, but Yocto doesn't match, and we move Yocto kernel doesn't match. So there is always yeah. customers are in a dilemma which one to pick, either pick latest LTS kernel or latest LTS Yocto, and yeah. it's a difficult right. thing. I know your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know your answer. Yeah, so we have a, a, a paid a, a contractor, a LTS maintainer. So we, we can only afford uh, uh, to do LTS every two years. Uh, so uh, so uh, TI should uh, actually uh, in, uh, uh, <laughs> 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 step up uh, step up a Yocto project membership uh, back to uh, Platinum. So are we talking Say there's about a, there was a comment up here if you want to throw the mic. Yeah, um, how does it take to get 
I don't know the answer. Yeah, one, one maintainer. Pro probably one slash two maintainers. It, depend it depends on, on how much actual maintenance you're going to do. But yeah, I mean, it does not only apply to, to, um, to the kernel. It applies to about everything. We hear it all the time. And as Dennis just said, it's always resources. Look, look at, our, uh, at our members list and imagine how many devices alone in this room are running Yocto. And everybody go out, please throw money because this is <laughs> this is the only way you can get a sustainable environment. That's it. So throw money or personnel. That, 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 the big difference I'm is having a, a, an upstream repository of something working and having it integrated working and testing in Yocto. That's, that's a massive difference. Look, look at Chromium. Chromium is in an upstream repository and working. Having it on a Yocto powered device is like the massive pain in the ass. I am entitled to say that because I'm not an American. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, real quick. Well, I don't know, just put it down. There. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to. I was going to have you throw it to me, but that makes no sense because I have a mic. Um, uh, Let's see, where to go from here? I'm sorry, but in the interest of time, I'm skipping testing. I know. <laughs> testing is a huge... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, okay. So, well, we're not even going to have time. We'll, we'll come back to testing and during discussions. Okay, two things. Two, two things I want to cover real quick before we get to open discussion. One, we had something that I called the Embedded Linux Leadership Summit uh in at elc or eos in june and we went around the room and and uh talked about well what are some of the big big concerns and this was the list this is a very short summary of the list of things that people came up with uh you notice that uh, not enough contributions to investment in infrastructure is on there heterogeneous core support <laughs> so a lot of our designs have heterogeneous cores and actually you could argue that the MCU issue that TI raised earlier this week is is exactly that is how to how to talk to stuff off the off the main CPUs. Um, but another some other interesting ones are upstream AI and machine learning accelerators. Uh, I don't know who's running into that, but we've got a lot of real, uh, for lack of a better word, funky hardware uh, coming down the pipe. Uh, the you know AI accelerators that it would be good if there was a common way to communicate with those or drive those. Um, I don't know, so I'm not looking for any answers here. But this is uh, if you see something on this list that kind of resonates with you, uh, uh, let me know. Um, this is kind of what the the top people I think are uh, is uh, are some of the big issues. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> okay. Shall I pass it um, if I may add one point to that list, yeah, <laughs> a bit related to uh, to AI. Uh... Go ahead, Laura. Okay. I wasn't sure if people could hear me. Uh, yeah, the AI and ML accelerators, that's something that uh, we've been looking at also uh, related to cameras because people want to uh, to consume camera streams and process them with that. Uh, and we also have lots of issues on the, on the camera side with lots of system, not just embedded system, but going to desktop systems also, uh, going for embedded ISPs inside the SOC with lots of, uh, of harder differences, different way to communicate with them, lack of documentation, I mean, the usual story so this is uh, the, the whole ecosystem uh, around cameras and ai is actually problematic uh, there is there are people moving forward with that but it's i, I do agree that it's uh, one big issue yeah Reem, do you want to say something about android or aosp oh well, you know it's hard to sort of summarize everything but essentially one of the benefits people get out of using android is the standardized api you right. know um, you get in there google's done the homework they got an API, you get Joe app developer off the street, they're not equipped for your system, which is something in the embedded Linux world where you're specking your own libraries and choosing what you want and sort of educating people to use your system. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's what one of the, one of the benefits that people tell me they get out of AOSP is, hey, somebody else is in my homework. Right. 
Well, and, and Google continues to pour a lot of resources into it. That's true. Uh, I have a question. This embedded Linux leadership, does it mean like uh, leading producers of embedded Linux har uh, devices or does it mean leaders of projects uh, this, this offering was, the service? This was, this was a group of people I could round up at ELC. <laughs> but, it, but we had, because I, but I we had okay, so I, I can tell you who was there. So we had, we had some representatives of some of the con major consulting companies. We had Bay Libre there. We had Bootlin there. We had uh, we had Linaro there. We had Arm. We had um, Amazon. No, was it Amazon or Meta? AWS. Was, it was a cigar. Yeah, I called it the Cabal meeting. But anyway, um, no. But I mean, we tried to get processor vendors and consultants, and but but I don't know. Because it seems to me some of them could help with the lack of investment in infrastructure tools and upstreaming. Well, yes, uh, rep yes, that's true. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I want there's one other thing I want to cover real quick, and it's under the topic of community. So I think that we don't have a strong enough community. Um, I th I think we have a community, and there's a lot of a lot of us that know each other. Uh, but, um, and there's a lot of projects, so there are some embedded Linux mailing lists, but okay, let's face the music. These go largely unused. And one of the reasons that like, for instance, the Linux embedded list get goes unused is because you'll never get that recommended from Git maintainer because embedded Linux is not a, is not something you can put a file, uh, wildcard on. In the kernel source tree, so you know, so you have to know to use it, and and anyway, so I don't know if anyone has a suggestion for how to fix that. I'm out. What? For sure, learning. <laughs> oh, machine learning. <laughs> oh, okay. Because you could oh, that's actually interesting. Right? Oh, I just attended a session on Reg Zbot, which is this thing that just monitors the email list and then occasionally will yep. throw something out. We need a Discord server. <laughs> a Discord server. Okay. Um, so the other thing is, okay, so there's all there's no end of organizations and projects. You got Linaro, Linux Foundation, which has a ton of different projects, R ROS, AOSP, Yocto Project, Build Root, Open WRT for build systems. Here's just the Linux Foundation projects, right? So we've got CIP, Elisa, Open Chain, SPDX, Automotive Grade Linux, Kernel CI, Yocto Project, Drone Code. Uh, the core embedded Linux project, okay, which ostensibly should be managing this thing, is actually shutting down. So the companies that were involved with that uh, have declared victory. And uh, <laughs> um, but what that means is, oh, and then we have our events. And I think we're actually doing pretty good with events. I'm not going to dwell on that one. Uh, this is some of the ones coming up. Either just recently we had embedded recipes in uh, Paris recently, and then we got plumbers here. FOSDEM, there are regional events. Uh, one of the things I really want to talk about real quick is eLinux Wiki. So eLinux Wiki, I know it's got a ton of old information on it, but it has, it's it's still useful. If you go out and look up, there's, there's information on boot time reduction out there, the tools you can use and some of the techniques. Um, it's not, it's kind of uneven. It hasn't been main, well maintained. So, and it's about to lose its funding. So we're looking for, uh, people willing to help out. Uh, so if you have an interest in this, uh, the best thing is to get on the eLinux wiki dash dev email list or just send me an email. Uh, I said at Embedded Linux Conference that I was going to try and put together kind of a committee uh, to work on this. And I just, <laughs> I had, uh, I didn't get to it because I had some, some things in, her, in my personal life that interfered with my plans. Um, but uh, but I still am really interested in this. I think this could be a great resource for us. I know wikis are not the best thing in the world, but but it's a good it you it is a place to store information uh, that we can share amongst ourselves, right? It's it's persistent, and uh, we've we've got the funding. We if you want to fund it, we can do that as well. Uh, Laurent, do you have something you want to add? Okay. Um, What's the funding used for for 
What? What does the funding cover for you and Swiggy? Uh, right now, okay, so we are paying for an administrator to keep the spam off of it. So it's not a lot of money. I have uh, one company who said that they're willing to, that they might be willing to cough up. I mean, I'm looking for probably, I think I can keep it alive, the administrator, for like 6000 a year, which is not a lot of money. So if I could get like two or three companies paying 2 k a piece, and it also hosts a whole bunch of board data. So like if you go out there and you look at, there, there's all kinds of, so it's a good resource. Um, and so if you think your company might be willing to uh, do something like that, it's, it's low, low budget. Um, we used to pay more for it. Anyway, comment? Something you glossed over really quickly that I don't know if everybody's aware of, but ELC, the whole rotating of ELC, it's only once a year in Europe and once a year in North America. Yes. And that, to me, is an opportunity to actually do some more of these smaller regional events. I mean, Embedded Recipes being one, Fosdem, but like, it's an opportunity to cultivate smaller regional events as well. So I think that should be, I just wanted to, you went over yeah. it quickly. I just wanted I did. to repeat I, it. Though. And we don't have time to cover everything. And uh, yes, uh, speaking of uh, events, uh, can we get the uh, uh, CELF uh, back, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, someone, uh, probably someone in this room, but someone said uh, that the events at the Kabuki were some of the most fun. I mean, and the, so anyway. If you if you go back that far, yeah. um, okay. So now with the one minute we have left, uh, we can talk. Uh, let's see. We can have open discussions. Uh, <laughs> so what is the kernel lacking? Uh, what yeah. what is your opinion? What what is missing for embedded Linux? Well, okay. Besides besides uh, getting all of the processor vendors upstream. Uh, <laughs> besides that one, which we all know. I mean, it's what are the kernels? What? These are plural kernels. Oh, did I say kernel? No, no. It's oh, easy to say kernel. Yeah. Why? Because there's so many kernels. Oh, we should be using that. Okay. Uh, Mike, right there. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd say more maintainers who guide the developers to go into proper directions. Okay. One of the topics that got discussed widely here is also the overall power management structure where we have so many different cores in our SOCs and so many low power modes that we need to be able to take decisions from Linux how we can enter different modes. Yeah. Any, okay, so some of the other questions I got on here while you're throwing that. Yeah, well, yeah, the topic kind of, the of, uh, of maintainers, if, if I may add what? to what Wolfram said, uh, what I've noticed is that we have an increasing number of contributors from SOC vendors, which is really good, but who are mostly focused on solving the immediate issue without looking at a big picture. And that's really drowning us as maintainers to keep things afloat. Uh, and I think that's becoming an increasingly big problem. And I think you have the last comment because we're right at the... I know there's documentation, but there's no documented design. So it makes testability really hard. We don't have a design to test against. So. Okay. Okay. I uh, wish we had, I, let's have some hallway conversations while we still have a little bit of time. Uh, but there's a, uh, I think there's a lot of things we could do to, to build a stronger embedded Linux community and ecosystem. And lot, there's, there's plenty of technical work left. So, thank you.